covering myself. Oh, yes. I have written a note there saying that please look there. Okay. Screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No problem. No problem, sir. We'll just start in another minute. Okay. Mr. Janu, it's so nice to see you. Yes. Mr. Janu, I have heard so much about you. Missed you when, when you were in Anamalais. So. Um, Dr. Ajit, is it me uh, you were addressing? Yes. Good to see uh, you, I nice said. To, nice to see you too. Uh, yes, yes. I missed you when I, you were in Anamalais. I have heard uh, so much about you from Sonali and others. And uh, <laughs> it's, really, it's really a pleasure to meet you. Online yes, yes. help Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll so, really catch up. So sorry to interrupt. We'll just start with the session now. And uh, so firstly, I would like to say namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our seventh Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo webinar. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75 week long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August, 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking this celebration forward with a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, The People Connect, wherein we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos for, for the entire duration, celebrating one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in the seventh week of this Mahotsav, and our species in focus for this week is the lion-tailed macaque, and the zoo in focus is the... Uh, Arignar Anna Zoological Park, Chennai. And uh, today for our Know Your Species uh, uh, section of the talk, that part of the talk, we have Dr. Ajit Kumar. And a brief introduction about Dr. Ajit. Dr. Ajit is one of India's leading primatologists. He began his career in wildlife conservation with a survey of primates in South India way back in the 1970s. He did his doctorate from the, from the Cambridge University on the ecology and population dynamics of the lion-tailed macaque in the Western Ghats. And over his four decade long career so far, Dr. Kumar has added many feathers to his cap whilst helping various roles in scientific institutions. His research not only ext extends not just on primates, but also on uh, herpetofauna, smaller carnivores, rodents, and our other arboreal mammals. And Dr. Kumar is currently serving as the uh, is currently affiliated with the Center for Wildlife Studies, Bangalore, as the senior scientist, and will today speak to us on the lion-tailed macaques and the lessons that we have to learn from wild. Over to you, sir. I would request you to now please begin your talk. I have to share. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Is it okay? No. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So uh, you know, I'm. I must say, I'm very, very happy to be among my uh, friends and colleagues from the uh, zoo management as well as uh, researchers. And uh, these days, one is not very happy often, especially uh, you know if you are in Bangalore or in Delhi, etc. So I'm indeed very, very happy, and it's a privilege to talk to uh, this audience. And I should thank uh, Mr. Jana as well as uh, Dr. Sonali Ghosh. For this opportunity, so given uh, you know uh, about 20 minutes, I thought uh, uh, what I will do is to uh, draw five important lessons uh, that about lantern monkey that I think are um, that I, that I'll draw from nearly 40 years of research uh, on on the species in the wild, and this research has been only partly by me. Little by me and mostly by uh, people like Mahapati and Dr. Kumara and Dr. Mawa Singh, Dr. Krishnamani, etc. Um, and these uh, lessons will, uh, you know, our lessons, these five lessons are what I think are very important. And these would, uh, you know, be on uh, feeding and uh, behavior, general behavior, um, group, uh, you know, structure and uh, composition and uh, something about reproduction and finally about life history. Uh, and then I think I, I think it's important to touch upon uh, the problems of lantern monkey in captivity, which I do. I briefly compare the situation in our zoos to those in, um, in the European and American zoos and maybe discuss what can be done. But before I go there, 
uh, to the talk. I would uh, try to impress you that uh, uh, you know lantern monkey is indeed uh, you know uh, very very uh, uh, special uh, species. It is uh, special from the point of view of evolution. It is special uh, from the point of uh, view of its adaptation to to its uh, habitat. Um, so, so this is this is you know this is my talk basically. Um, and as you know, uh, we have uh, you know some eight species of uh, macaques, and uh, um, you know depending upon whom you talk to, there are anywhere between ten and fifteen or sixteen uh, species of uh, uh, leaf-eating langurs, and uh, we have one species of gibbon and uh, two species of loris. Altogether, maybe about twenty-five uh, species. The thing is that most of these species, uh, you know, the langurs, which are the colobines, as well as the gibbons and lorises, have uh, come from the langurs came from uh, northern Africa, uh, moved along perhaps through China and entered uh, India through the northeast. And the same was true for loris as well as uh, for gibbon. But this is not true for macaques. They came from uh, from the western side. They came into India probably about five million or so, five million years ago. Macaca paleo indicus is about five million years old from the Siwalix. And it is believed that they came from from the west. And uh, if you you know if you uh, know a little bit of geology, you know you know that India probably occurred at a much southern uh, latitude at that time had uh, very poor humid conditions which promoted uh, rainforest and much of peninsular India, except the country too, was covered with rainforest and uh, the, the what is called a proto silenus group, which was the ancestor of all the macaques in, in, uh, in Asia, uh, came quickly and spread to the south and one branch apparently went to, to uh, Southeast Asia and uh, speciation took uh, under you know happened there most of the speciation macaques happened in southeast asia and many of them came back again through uh, northeast to to india you know species like bonnets and trees etc and therefore uh, you know uh, even though uh, you know i i believe that at that time rainforest uh, also occurred along the east coast and the protosilinus came to western guards and along the eastern guards went off to to southeast asia and because this area was Probably uh, um, uh, a big barrier to, to to animal movement at that time because it was primarily grassland and dry forest about three million years ago at least. And therefore, what I the point is that uh, lantern macaque is the ancestor of all the Asian macaques. Um, so it, it you know uh, evolutionarily very significant species. And um, you know because it came here maybe about you know three four million years ago. Probably at Proto Silenus, it has been a resident of tropical rainforest for a very long time, and probably the longest time among all the macaques. So, you know, this comes with a certain. Um, uh, uh, and so, I must also say that uh, you know that uh, much of peninsular India at that time was covered with the tropical rainforest about three million years ago, and uh, uh, you know the monsoon set in slowly because of the upliftment of Himalayas, etc. The rainforest withdrew from. Most of peninsular India now is restricted along only along the western guards. And uh, therefore, uh, you can call lentil monkey a refuge uh, in the western guards. And uh, along with a whole bunch of uh, flowering plants, as well as uh, uh, about 30,000 species of flowering plants, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, they're all probably refuges. refugees in, this, in the western guards um, once they were distributed over over much of uh, peninsular India. Um, so it's a, it's, that's a very, spe very, very special, very special uh, uh, species. And one of the lesson is that, uh, that we have uh, learned over time is that it's very highly adapted to eating, uh, to getting their energy primarily from fruits and seeds. So if you look at their, uh, um, digestive uh, uh, alimentary uh, canal, they have a very simple stomach, much like ours, and uh, and um, a little bit saculated uh, uh, colon or large intestine, much like ours. And uh, so they, they have to eat things like wheat. We get most of our energy now from grains. 
uh, but unfortunately there are no grains in the in the tropical forest they get it from fruits and seeds and uh, uh, and this is very unlike uh, you know langurs which have a stomach which is like that of a that of a cow more or less and they can get everything they don't need uh, uh, addition of protein from somewhere else etc they can digest uh, leaves and get energy from the cell hemicellulose and uh, manufacture most of the amino acids using microbes in their stomach etc this is very unlike uh, uh, you know as we, we know that we can't eat uh, much of leaves uh, we have to cook them very well and we eat those leaves not necessarily for energy but we, we eat it for uh, specific micronutrients like vitamins and minerals etc so that is uh, you know one thing that we need to know that they are very highly adapted to getting energy from fruits and seeds and we have uh, you know identified our uh, you know our entire range of western guards they feed on nearly 200 fruits of near fruits and seeds of nearly 200 species uh you know uh, in a day they they probably eat only five six uh, uh, species of fruits but you know fruits the, the the trees and fruit the species and fruit changing keep changing every week and uh, over a course of a year or two they eat uh, nearly in any one locality, they might eat fruits of nearly 100 species of trees, or trees and other um, climbers, etc. Now, you know that uh, the problem with eating, uh, getting energy from fruits and seeds is that there's no, they don't have any protein. Fruits and seeds don't have any protein, so they need to get their protein. And they can't get it from leaves because they can digest leaves like us. And so they get it from primarily from um, um, folivorous insects, especially caterpillars and leaf hoppers and uh, and also from spiders and you know bark other bark insects and sometimes uh, you know fruits get heavily infested with insects caterpillars and it's an amazing source of protein for them and uh, very opportunistically they eat uh, frogs and squirrels and sometimes giant squirrel babies and and lizards and birds eggs and bats and whatever comes their way uh, and so that is the reason why they are primarily confined to, to uh, rainforest. One is that uh, uh, only the rainforest can provide them with uh, year-round supply of uh, fruits and seeds on which they really depend for energy. And only rainforest can provide them with an abundance of green foliage and from which they can get their uh, uh, invertebrates as a source of protein. So they need really large areas of, of, of rainforest in order to survive. The second lesson is that, you know, because they depend on, uh, on fruits and, uh, and especially on, on invertebrates, they have a very active life. So if you look at their uh, uh, activity budget, uh, they spend about 35% of the daytime feeding and uh, they spend, uh, you know, uh, about 50% of their time uh, foraging and traveling. They, they travel and they look for uh, insects, primarily look for insects. Um, all the time. So 85% of the time of their time goes on, on uh, food related matters. Uh, very little time for uh, things that you must have seen bonnet monkeys and rhesus monkeys doing, which is social interactions, sleeping in the afternoon and you know fighting and things like that. They, they rarely do. They don't have the time. They are really thoroughly busy, busy uh, looking for uh, protein. And uh, lesson number three, is that they live in relatively small groups compared to bonnet monkeys and and uh, rhesus monkeys. Now, usually, most of the groups in in a, in its natural habitat. I am not talking of uh, you know forest fragments uh, where they can't disperse. But in a large contiguous forest, they live in relatively small groups of you know eighteen or so animals and with one adult male, six to adult females, probably one subadult uh, male, and a whole bunch of uh, bunch of uh, uh, juveniles, but the important thing to remember is that uh, the uh, like in other macaques, the the core of the group, the core of the group are the females, and uh, it's a very matrilineal society. There is there's sometimes a grandmother, mother, daughter, so, or otherwise it's mother, daughter, and sisters, and uh, that is the that is a core group. And uh, males come and go. They are not particularly, they are often called leaders. They are not really leaders. They are just hanging around and purely for the purpose of uh, mating. And they 
often uh, are not in the group they are you know, they are in the periphery of the group etc um, so and their tenure is usually only about five to six years they, they, i think they become sexually mature about seven eight years or something and uh, by the time they have a, a group of their own they might be 10 years old and maybe they stay for five years or so and then they get uh, you know displaced by uh, by another male or sometimes it's probably the subadult male uh, in the group. But it's important to realize that uh, the, the replacement, uh, you know, um, uh, takes a lot of time. It, as Kumara was telling you the other day, that, you know, that, re that uh, replacement happens over several months. It is not that uh, one day one male can come kick out this guy and uh, uh, take over the group, you know, uh, it takes time. And because he has to be accepted by the females, etc. And uh, the females rarely leave the group. They live in the group and die in the group, unless uh, you know, there is a fish in the group. And lesson number four is that they mate uh, throughout the year, but mating is confined to you know a period uh, uh, to the, only to the follicular phase of the you know, female uh, reproductive uh, cycle. As you know, primates have menstrual cycles, and uh, not estrous cycles as in other uh, mammals. So they have menstrual cycles. So the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle is about 14 days. And that is time, uh, that is when the uterus is preparing itself um, to, to receive uh, the embryo. And that lasts about 14 days. And in the wild, the mating frequency goes up. Um, I think uh, from early follicular phase and uh, goes up uh, and peaks at about 14 days or something and suddenly then stops. Or, or, and this is very closely linked to the to the size of the sexual swelling that the female has. There's a slow inflation phase. The swelling becomes slowly, slowly bigger and then uh, suddenly deflates. So it's very closely uh, linked to that. The second uh, thing about reproduction that we should keep in mind is that uh, lantern monkey is a multiple mount ejaculator. It's not a single mount ejaculator, unlike bonnets. Um, but rhesus, for example, it, it takes a series of mounts, sometimes four or five uh, mounts to, for males to ejaculate. So, um, uh, and same is true for, uh, for rhesus. So this is important because uh, uh, you know, if there are uh, other males, they often disrupt uh, this process of mating. And uh, sometimes the females also disrupt. Um, I've seen in the wild that uh, females often disrupt each other's mating. And uh, this has also been reported uh, in captivity in, in Germany that fem females suppress uh, reproduction by other females. So these are, these are important things that one should, uh, you know, uh, keep in mind. And uh, the, I think perhaps the most important uh, thing in the, in the uh, uh, ecology of uh, Lender Makak is its life history and its, its inability to grow fast uh, I, uh, you know, as a population. And uh, you know, it has an age at uh, first parturition for females at six years, first parturition. So probably they become um, sexually mature uh, at about five years or something. And then uh, we carry through a, uh, a gestation, which is like you know uh, 170, 175 days, and they give birth at about six years. Or so this is considerably higher, one or two years higher than uh, what you find in other macaques. And the second thing is that they have very low uh, birth rate. Uh, this has been highlighted by others also. They're, they're on uh, at a population level, they give birth. Uh, only at about 2.5 years. It is likely that younger females might give birth, uh, you know, little uh, at, at uh, shorter intervals. But as you females mature, they give birth. So at a population level, they give birth only once in 2.5 years, and they have a long weaning period. Uh, if you see bonnet monkeys, uh, you know, uh, by March, April, you will see that all virtually all females are given birth. Uh, almost like 100%. Uh, birth rate um, and uh, they do that next year also. So they have extremely short uh, weaning time, maybe five, six months, and uh, they are ready to, to uh, carry through another pregnancy next year. And uh, again, uh, the, 
So very low birth rate and you know long age of first birth solution. The only thing that that saves them and uh, it's allowed them to persist is very high survival to to adulthood eighty percent. This will be very different from bonnet monkeys where the survival to adulthood would be only like forty percent or even less. So most of the infants that are born very high infant mortality rate in the case of I think lantern monkey in the wild it's only about thirteen percent. In the case of bonnets, it will be much higher. And then there are a lot of juvenile mortality in bonnets. It's not there in lentil monkeys. So what they have done, uh, you know, given the stability of uh, of the rainforest uh, in terms of food, uh, food availability, it's highly stable. And what they have done is to invest heavily on infants and not produce many infants, but uh, increase their uh, survival to adulthood. So anything that you know threatens uh, uh, threatens uh, uh, survival is a big problem for for the species. So this would be poaching. This could be disease uh, in the in captivity. Also, it could be disease or some other reason. So if you have, I, there's not much you can do with uh, with uh, birth rate. You cannot increase much. Uh, we we found that they give probably give birth to five or six, uh, you know, uh, uh, infants, uh, female in its life. And uh, and if you consider 80% uh, survival to adulthood, that is about, uh, you know, five uh, animals to adulthood and male, female, 50, 50, if you take two and a half, two and a half. So the female is just about able to replace herself and add one more, that's it. This, this is very different from other mechanics. So this is something that we need to, to to, um, to seriously consider and probably one of the reason that we have such a low um, growth rate in, in captivity. So these are the five five things that I think are very important. One is the feeding, which is energy from fruits, but they need protein and something that we need to consider in uh, in captivity. They cannot eat leaves. There's no point in giving them lettuce and cabbage and uh, you know other things that you can give to langurs, but you cannot give to to, to uh, LTMs and expect them to get anything out of it. And just like we can't get anything out of cabbage and lettuce. And uh, protein is something that, that we really need. Um, and they also spend a lot of time exploring. And this is something that people in captivity have noticed. They, they are not very inclined to socially interact. And But on the other hand, if there is enough enrichment in the environment, they're happy looking for things. So this is something that we need to think and group composition um you know single adult male and stable adult uh, 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 stable adult female group and um, uh, um you know and uh, the thing is that we cannot uh, you know the, the the male female relationship group relationship is built over time and it takes time to build that relationship so things like a uh, prone breeder, etc., I have no, no, those terms should not be used in the case of land. Like what is a prone breeder in Chennai? Will be a disaster perhaps in Trivandrum, which is shifted overnight. So you know it depends on the relationship and uh, breeding, and uh, you know it is also during your uh, uh, period of uh, sexual swelling. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, and. Uh, you need to consider that males are, are multiple mount ejaculators. There is suppression, there is disruption, etc. happening often. And uh, the life history, low birth rate, and I don't think we can do much to increase the birth rate in, in perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but we, we need to ensure that survival rate is very high, you know, as to adulthood especially. And if any threat to that uh, will be a disaster. So having said that, you know it is you know it is good to look at uh, the uh, uh, briefly look at uh, the population uh, the growth in uh, our zoos and this data is taken from uh, uh, CSA Stud Book 2018 and we had a colony of lantern monkeys in 1980s late 80s they're doing extremely well 80 monkeys and look at their rate of growth this is not really uh, because uh, the animals were caught from the wild there was a colony in Delhi Zoo which was doing when Dr. Desai was a director there, we were just doing very, very well. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the zoos came up in Jaipur, came up in Patna, and, uh, you know, females uh, were supplied 
to other zoos in the name of proven breeders. So the entire colony got disrupted, and that was the end, the collapse of our of our uh, uh, captive colony from 1980s. Uh, and we, I, I don't think our zoos really recovered after that uh, that uh, Delhi colony disaster. Um, and this is very unlike, uh, you know, in uh, in uh, German and European zoos, for example, they started more or less at the same time when our our population collapsed. That is the time when they started 1990s. And look at the growth of population; it's almost double from 90 to more than double to nearly 200 animals over a period of nine or ten years. And uh, uh, so this is a, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 the same story in American zoos that uh, they started or almost at the same time, and uh, they had by 2000 they had a surplus population. They were willing to give away groups. And the same thing with you know in European zoos. So while our population is going down and uh, and staying at the bottom. They were their population was flourishing, and uh, the reasons are not uh, you know this is old data. 1996. I have not been able to get uh, uh, good quality data after 1996, but I don't think the situation has changed to become any better. Um, infant survival rate zoos out outside India, you know, it is still quite uh, you know quite low compared to uh, survival rate in the wild, but uh, uh, you know it's about 0.56. Look at Indian zoos. Uh, look at proportion of breeding females. Again, Indian zoos are doing very badly. And look at birth rate. You know, uh, uh, the, the European zoos have reasonably good birth rate. And look at our Indian zoos' birth rate. So this is a process by which population grows: infant birth rate, and breeding females, and uh, and infant uh, survival are the three key parameters if your captive colony has to grow. And I don't think Indian zoos are any better now as uh, compared to 1996. So, so um, you know, in, in 1982, uh, they were American and European zoos in the same problems as in India. But 19, as in India now, in India 1982 was actually doing quite well. The Delhi population was doing quite well. Uh, we had 1992. We had the first uh, international seminar on the lion-tail monkey in uh, in Baltimore. And that is the first time data was coming from the wild about their diet, about group composition, and about their mating behavior, and about uh, life history. And what the American and European uh, zoos did was to integrate that knowledge into into their breeding program, and they also initiated, tied up with uh, other organizations to for a better understanding of reproductive physiology of females, better healthcare, better nutrition, and and they bred animals in a way that uh, genetic variability was not lost. And uh, by 2000, they had an overpopulation. And uh, unfortunately, we are, uh, you know, stuck uh, in the old, uh, the old problems. So, what should we do? Is is a question. I think there. I don't think there has been uh, as good uh, integration as is possible of the knowledge that we have from the wild into in terms of captive populations, I, you know, about feeding and nutrition. I don't think, uh, you know, many zoos, they still survive on banana and modern bread rather than uh, 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 a diet that is balanced in terms of carbohydrates, in terms of minerals and, and protein. And uh, I think, you know, I'll take into account their calorie requirements, etc. I don't think we have uh, 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 addressed uh, the their problems that they have, that it is a very active species, uh, it is not a very socializing species, and we need to provide them with an enriched, uh, as in as in Wanderlur Zoo or in Trivandrum Zoo. I don't think that is true for many other zoos. That they need an environment which is highly complex in which they can um, exercise their curiosity, exercise their um, you know um, searching behavior, etc. to the fullest. And a group structure is something that uh, we need to really uh, to, to look at, and you cannot, uh, you know, have these uh, terms like proven breeder and uh, and introduce proven breeders from other places suddenly to the group. It doesn't work, uh, you know, because uh, mating is as much a social activity as as it is uh, a reproductive activity. So we need to really look at that carefully. 
and uh, you know uh, reproduction and life history is something that uh, that uh, we need to really look at uh, the uh, you know uh, what Wonderful Zoo has some excellent data that uh, whenever you're talking about over so many years, we can look at where does the problem lie in terms of demographics? Where do things go? Where are various things going wrong? Is it in reproduction? Is it in survival? Or is it, is it in age structure? Where is it going wrong? So I think it is interesting to, to look at. And, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is that uh, the, 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 the European, American and Singapore Zoo have an amazing wealth of knowledge about their captive colonies, which are in public domain. It, you know, people can read about it and that unfortunately is, is not there. And, uh, uh, and I mean, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, we go to uh, Singapore Zoo, people go to Brown Zoo and uh, they see uh, uh, only the facade, only the uh, curio center, and only the canteen, and the electric vehicles, and the solar lighting. But they don't look at the, I think, the way animals are managed, the planning that goes into planning uh, uh, cattle breeding, and uh, the knowledge levels of every member of the zoo is something that this is amazing. Uh, what we call as zookeepers or uh, caretakers, amazing knowledge about the species that they are managing and they are looking after that. I don't think that is true for most of the Indian zoos. There may be exceptions. And those kind of, you know, things uh, what you know, well, well informed caretakers. And uh, finally, I think we need to, uh, we cannot expect uh, throw some females and some males together and expect them to breed and uh, have a growing colony. It doesn't work. We need to identify, we need to identify what is the problem. We need to do research. On, how to address this problem, then you need to change our management based on that research and then monitor and that will find additional problems and that cycle has to go on. And uh, unless it is very closely, you know, uh, uh, linked to research uh, in, in a problem solving manner, um, you know, we, we are not uh, going to uh, go uh, self-sustaining uh, colony. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. And I should acknowledge Dr. Mahapati, Dr. Mehwa Singh, and uh, Mr. P.C. Tyagi, etc. Uh, and um, Mr. Yalaki, we, you know, we, we, in 2001, we thought of having a coordinated breeding program. And Mr. Tyagi was the uh, director at that time of the zoo, of Wandler uh, Zoo. And we spent so many days and evenings planning uh, cattle breeding. We wrote away proposal. Caesar gave us money, and everything was kind of finally did not work out because of you know various reasons. So I hope uh, it doesn't go. If that doesn't happen. We really did uh, a lot of work, and uh, Mr. Tyagi spent so much of effort on this. So much. He was so thoroughly disappointed at the end of it. And uh, you know, and uh, and Dr. Sonali Ghosh and. Um, Mr. So Jana, for uh, again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did I overshoot? No, no, sir. You were well within time. Thank you so much, sir, for the informative talk on the lessons that we should learn from wild and how to integrate them within our zoos, uh, within the captive population. Uh, we will take questions for this session towards the end of the talk. And we now move on to the second part of the talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So for the Know Your Zoo session, we have uh, Mr. Devashish Jana, who is the APCCF and the director of Arignanana Zoological Park. A brief introduction about of Mr. Jana. Mr. Jana is a 1992 badge Tamil Nadu cadre IFS officer. He has served in uh, different capacities with the state and the central government and has handled various portfolios in policy formulation, implementation, evaluation, and monitoring schemes. Notably, the National Afforestation Program and India's responses to United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification are some of the key things that key uh, paths that he has taken care of. And he has joined as the director of Arignarana Zoological Park in 2020 and will today speak to us more on the history and its current management practices in the zoo. I would now request uh, Mr. Jana to please begin his presentation. So you can stop, um, Dr. Kumar, you can stop sharing your screen. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar, Manakam, 
and a very good morning. Let me at the outset preface my talk by saying that the title of this session, Know All About the Zoo, is a bit of a misnomer and it is not to be taken literally and so seriously. Essentially, the caption was to promote the session and to seek and catch your attention. So please don't be uh, carried away. I have been here at this zoo for around seven months. And the more I attempt to know and understand, the more ignorant I find myself to be. So on my part, I propose to walk you through a brief overview of the zoo, the challenges that we are grappling with as of now, the bright and the not so bright areas and a proposed way forward. That's an aerial perspective view or a bird's uh, eye view of the zoo. Next. The layout plan of the zoo. Next. The, the genesis of this zoo dates back to 1855. Uh, in fact, in 1854, the then uh, director of Madras Central Museum, Mr. Edward Balfour, he somehow persuaded the then uh, Nawab of Karnatik to hand over his uh, animal collection or a menagerie, as we call it in zoo parlance, and uh, set up uh, what has been the country's first public zoo in, in very much inside the zoo museum premises. And uh, this museum was again, this zoo was again shifted to a public park near Chennai Central Station uh, later in 1861. And the management was transferred to Madras Corporation. Later, it was found that the uh, location of the zoo was not very conducive to the well being of the animals. So it was decided to shift to its current location, which is Vandalur RF uh, of Tamil Nadu, the present location, and it was inaugurated by the then CM uh, Mr. Ramachandran on 24th July 1985. So um, the zoo has come a long way since then. It has been a, a transformational journey of sorts, spanning 165 years. Next. The zoo is spread over an extent of 602 hectares, which includes a rescue and rehabilitation center uh, with an extent of 92.45 hectares. The CZA has given it recognition till 23, and it happens to be a coordinating zoo for the species in focus, which is LTM, and Nilgiri Langur and Nilgiri Tan. And it has also been a participating zoo for Indian God, Indian Giant Squirrel, Wild Dog, and since 2019, we are an institutional member of the Waza Next. That's a view slide about the mandate, the mission, and the vision, which is uh, mostly common to all our zoos. Next. Uh, these are the norms as per the recognition of zoo rules 1992. Uh, for categorizing a zoo as a large zoo, as against the norms, uh, Arena Rana Zoological Park has got these uh, statistics, which are discernible on the slide itself. Next. That's our animal collection, which has uh, over the years been increasing, both the species, number of species, as well as the uh, animals, animals uh, during 2021 have come down because we uh, released a number of rescued animals, but the uh, number of species has been steadily increasing and we are at 182 as of now. Next. Next please. Yeah, that's uh, some data about the visitor footfall. 
um, during 2021, um, obviously it is attributable to the uh, lockdown. Uh, it has shown a nose type. Next. These are some special attractions of the Manguru Zoo, which uh, makes it a big draw among the children as well as the uh, adults. Uh, this iconic cave-like entrance was uh, designed, it was arranged to be designed by the then CM, uh, Honorable CM, Mr. Uh, Ramachandran, who engaged a cine set designer to get this design in London. And uh, we have a butterfly park, a walk through the baby, uh, two replicas uh, of our Point Kalimar and Bedangangal Bird Sanctuary, then a Oteri Lake, which uh, is also known as uh, Bird Watchers Paradise, the Reptile House, and the Children's Park. Next. Uh, these are some visitor amenities uh, which we have been uh, building over the years. Uh, free cloak room. We have a zoo application, and uh, ticketing is enabled both uh, offline as well as online. Photo points and battery operated vehicles for zoo rounds and a shark model aquarium. Next. Yeah, we have around 100 uh, e cycles and bicycles. Uh, the zoo is also uh, served with portable RO. Uh, drinking water, and then uh, mothers, baby feeding rooms, toilets, restaurants, and uh, feed packages. Next. That shows at a glance the uh, revenue and expenditure pattern over the years. And uh, if you look at the last uh, three years, we have been actually spending more than we have earned. So uh, basically, we have been eating into the corpus and uh, other accruals. Next. So um, all said and done, uh, age is just a number and uh, size is also uh, just a number. It doesn't really matter. Uh, ultimately, it boils down to uh, the basic uh, fundamental mandate of a zoo which is uh, across all zoos, well-being of the animals housed. And they again hinge on three key constructs or pillars or livers, uh, housing, upkeep, and healthcare management. Next. In terms of housing, uh, we have uh, uh, the USP of Antelope Zoo is, um, uh, we have uh, tried to give these animals naturalized, simulated kind of environment. Since space hasn't been a constraint, we have been able to uh, get them actually. And uh, let me also inform at this juncture that the CZA has norms for housing for all the almost all the species. In 90% of the animals cases, we have been able to give space more than the uh, what the norms require us to do. Uh, however, in case of birds, uh, uh, it leaves some uh, something to be desired. In case of some birds, uh, these uh, these enclosures they were constructed long back in 1979. So that is an area where we need to improve. And we are right now we are uh, talking to some CSR partners to uh, make that happen. Next. That's a glimpse of some of the enclosures. Next. And uh, sorry, can we go back? Yeah, these are some uh, enrichment works uh, which make the animals feel at home. And uh, of course, uh, all rest and no play makes this animal uh, a very dull uh, animal. So therefore, uh, some enrichment works we have tried to do in all the enclosures, and this is again an area where we need to uh, do a lot more, a lot more, and we are also uh, trying to do that. Next, 
that gives a, a snapshot of the uh, feed requirement per day uh, in uh, all the categories, perishable, non-perishable, beef and liver, fish, green fodder, chicks and chicken. The uh, monthly bill, monthly bill for our feed on account of our feed comes to around 55 lakhs, 55 lakhs per month. That's the uh, that's the approximate amount we spend every month towards feed. Next, that's a glimpse of a feed store where the uh, a team of vets, biologists, and forest staff they ensure the uh, feed quality as well as quantity. Uh, as far as fodder is concerned, we are self-sufficient. Uh, we have our own fodder plot, which is established over uh, an extent of 30 acres, and we grow the grasses that we need for these animals to feed. Next. That shows the summer management that we carry out uh, uh, when the uh, mercury shoots up, um, and we have already started doing this for the animal enclosures to keep the humidity as well as temperature uh, well within manageable limits for the animals to uh, not to feel uh, stressed. Next. This is a rejuvenation camp which we conduct yearly. Uh, right now we have only two elephants, uh, Rohini and Prak Prakriti. They're, they're both are female and uh, we have hand reared these elephants. Next. That's zoo uh, ICE, e -I surveillance system. We have set up uh, a system of CCTVs, network of CCTVs uh, of around 180 plus cameras, uh, which give us uh, a view of what is happening in terms of visitor management as well as animal management. Next. Yes, these tech assisted ecosystems, they do, do have their own limitations. And all said and done, um, this technology can never be uh, a true substitute of uh, humans. So, human touch is very, very essential, and that is what we do emphasize on in our zoo. Next. So that's the size of the workforce. We have uh, uh, sanction uh, as against the sanction post of 252, uh, we have 140 in position. Um, the vacancies are being filled up slowly, though. And uh, it is all centralized. The vacancies are filled up by the government. And then uh, for long years, uh, right from inception, we have uh, uh, a Battalion of temporary staff who are 202 in number. And the wages, the salary bills also is indicated on this slide. Next. Yeah, uh, to, to uh, see that these uh, staff, they are um, future ready and they are skilled. We, we do have a cycle of skilling and upskilling and reskilling works. Um, in this, this, uh, this slide shows exactly that. Next. Needless to say, uh, in the current uh, context of the pandemic, uh, this, is, this happens to be one of the most important uh, management work that we do on a daily basis. These photos, they are speaking for themselves. Next. We have a full-fledged uh, veterinary hospital, well-equipped veterinary hospital, and uh, we, uh, which are manned by one veterinary officer and two assistant veterinary surgeons. Uh, next. As I said, uh, these are the equipment uh, which we can see on the view slides. Next. 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 
the uh, our surgeons uh, they have carried out a uh, uh, number of very difficult uh, procedures operations procedures these uh, slides tell about that next they have also published a number of research papers and uh, indeed very path breaking kind of uh, procedures next Next. Next. And uh, we, uh, our doctors and our uh, staff are also quite competent uh, in hand rearing orphaned or uh, deserted animals or rescued animals. Uh, they have a lot of expertise in this as well. Next. Next. These four elephants uh, that you see on the view slide are hand reared at the zoo. Currently, we have two, as I said, Prakriti and Rohini. The others, they have been sent to uh, Mudumalai and Anamalai caps. Next. That's, uh, that shows uh, in a nutshell our. Um, performance in captive breeding, uh, decadal uh, captive breeding. Next. Corial depiction of the species which we have been breeding very successfully and their tribe uh, has been increasing. Next. Same, continue. Next. Then uh, one of the important mandates of any zoo is to spread uh, conservation education. It is only when we when we uh, show the seeds of conservation in the minds of people that the cause of conservation can really uh, go any farther. So to this in uh, to this end, we have uh, uh, we have been operating a zoo school, uh, which uh, has been running a number of programs, uh, Jew ambassador, Jew volunteers, uh, and then uh, important forest and wildlife days are also celebrated. Next. Those are some pictorial uh, depictions of the programs as they were carried out uh, prior to the pandemic. These are all pre-pandemic photographs. Next. Yes, pre-pandemic photographs. Next. Uh, during 2021, uh, we, uh, for obvious reasons, we had to uh, do it uh, mainly on an uh, online platform. So, uh, utilizing this time, we could connect to 25 government schools and over 3,000 students from various districts of the state actively participated. Uh, and the ambassador program also, we normally we used to conduct camps in summer as well as winter. The summer camp had to be uh, necessarily conducted in uh, in an online mode, virtual on a virtual platform. Next. As I said, the Jew school also conducts other events in the shape of uh, thematic workshops uh, or various contests, promotional events, uh, etc. Next. Then we have a rescue and rehabilitation center uh, which was set up uh, way back in 2001 uh, under the aegis of the Central Zoo Authority. Uh, then uh, the animals uh, which are rescued uh, by the DRI Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, uh, the seizures effected at the uh, airports or uh, even the railway terminals, they have been handed over to the zoo and uh, we have been rehabilitating them. And uh, next. Uh, that's a, a live streaming uh, facility we we have put in place and uh, the interesting fact about this 
live streaming facility is that this is perhaps uh, the only zoo in the world which offers this facility for as many as 15 animals, absolutely free of cost. And uh, so far, this facility has had a, a hit or views of 4.5 crores, which is uh, something that we really feel good about. Next. And we all also have a zoo mobile app. Next. That's the zoo shop. And uh, the uh, savannas being sold in the uh, shop are being branded now uh, with the carry uh, tag of uh, Arigna Ranna Zoological Park. And then uh, um, to, to, to uh, take it further, what we are trying to do is now is that uh, the families of the animal keepers, we are encouraging them to prepare artifacts of their houses and form self-help groups of theirs. Uh, and even we are trying to uh, uh, impart those skills also at preparing uh, these toys and artifacts that will help as a um, uh, welfare measure for these animal keepers. Next. So uh, that brings us to a roadmap towards uh, becoming more resilient and uh, self-reliant and uh, if I may say self-sustaining as well. Um, currently, as uh, all zoos uh, are, we are also coping with the existential crisis and uh, a number of strategies and mechanisms we have tried to put in place. Uh, the, of course, we need to uh, continue to adhere to the COVID-19 protocol and uh, we have been uh, we have been doing a testing of our uh, animals as well as uh, the staff. And we also, uh, we, are, we have been trying to vaccinate our, animal, uh, vaccinate our staff. Uh, the entire uh, establishment uh, needs to be vaccinated as soon as we possibly can. Then in the, in the face of mounting pressure to redefine our priorities, we are re trying to reinvent ourselves. And a lot of cost cutting also needs to be undertaken, uh, which has been engaging our attention for quite some time now. Next. Uh, yes, uh, not to be untouched by the digital revolution that the country is uh, uh, going through. We, we have uh, now revamped our website and we have a, a chat bot uh, in place which uh, tries to interact with it. Is, we are trying to teach it as many uh, questions and uh, answers as it can possibly memorize. And uh, the same day booking is also enabled. And then um, the entire digital payment ecosystem has been expanded. Uh, a, a visitor, a prospective visitor can book uh, using any uh, any number of uh, digital payment uh, ecosystems. And then the animal adoption phase has also been streamlined. And shortly by this month end, uh, we will have a QR code based, uh, absolutely contactless kind of access control system uh, by this month end. Next. Now, um, as we discern from the uh, budgetary position of the zoo, uh, obviously there's a resource crunch now. We are faced with uh, last year, the government uh, helped us out. Uh, see, as far as feed and other things are concerned, they are mostly self-sustaining. The government bears, normally bears, uh, before the pandemic, the government has been bearing the uh, salary bill on account of the permanent uh, staff, but for the temporary staff and every other thing, uh, feed and other, all expenditure related to management uh, used to be born out of the head collections. Now, last year we were closed for around uh, eight months or so, and then again, uh, lockdown has been clamped down from 20th onwards. So uh, obviously uh, there's, a, there's a resource crunch so again, this year we have addressed the government to uh, to sanction the expenditure on account of the fee. And besides that, we have also been reaching out to some uh, partners who are trying to 
do they have bit under corporate social responsibility and mahindra uh, renault nissan and nissan then hcl state bank of india and indian bank they are the trying uh, the key partners we have been engaging with next Um, so, as I said, instead of uh, sourcing these ornamental hedge plants or hedge plants and uh, plants required for landscaping, we have now established an in house nursery where we are growing our own plants now. Next. And uh, that with the help of uh, Renault, uh, we have now replaced the rest sets in the all the animal enclosures to, uh, to the um, top left hand corner that was the uh, thatched rest shed earlier and after renovation uh, this is how it looks like these are all uh, simbopogon or uh, in tamil we call them nanjampul it is simbopogon or uh, lemongrass um, thatched rest sheds they look very ethnic and uh, they they also last for around three to five years. Next. And you can see the animals making use of that. Uh, they are quite happy with the rest sets, uh, which are basically in the nature of enrichment actually, how they're using it. And uh, it's it's really a treat to the uh, eyes to see them uh, use this rest sets. Next. And then uh, that's uh, on the left hand side, that's a, uh, a model of one old signage board, animal information signage board that we had. And now uh, they have actually uh, lost their utility or they have outlived their useful life actually. So uh, with the help of Renault Nissan, we are trying to uh, remodel the information signages. And this time around, we have uh, instead of sentences or paragraphs, we have tried to present the information in bullet points in uh, as interestingly as we possibly could. Next. That's another one uh, for Parasimha, and uh, this is being done for all the enclosures. Next. Yes, um, that again brings us to the uh, vital issue of ecological or carbon footprints, which we should be reducing. And uh, over the over a period of time, we should attempt to become carbon neutral or uh, at least carbon neutral, if not carbon negative. Then uh, we have been trying to uh, put in place a number of green solutions. The zoo has uh, actually constructed a lot of rain harvesting, uh, harvesting structures in the form of percolation ponds and uh, uh, and uh, ponds and all. And uh, this can also be done through micro irrigation of landscape areas, which we have started doing now to increase the water use efficiency through sprinklers and uh, drip irrigation, then solar powered lighting, this is an area where, where Reno is actually helping us out. They have uh, they are installing as many as 26 uh, solar powered street lamps. Then waste recycling. Uh, that's uh, on the right hand side. That's the that's the um, solid waste solid waste disposal shed which uh, we have newly constructed, and uh, we are also in uh, in a dialogue with some vendors for putting in place some liquid uh, disposal uh, recycling units as well. Uh, so we have been uh, trying to go develop some strategic imperatives and interventions with Renault and other CSR partners. Uh, one, one instance they said we could possibly uh, take up is crowdfunding uh, campaigns. Next. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the very informative talk on the zoo and the kind of setup that you're having right now. I would we would now take questions for the session, and we will first start with Dr. Kumar. Uh, Dr. Kumar, are you there? Yes. 
No. Uh, okay, sir. So the first question for you, sir, is that uh, has there been any comparative study done between the lion-tailed macaque and any, and the other arboreal or sympatric species in the Western mm -hmm. Ghats in terms of resource partitioning? Yes, yes. There have been, um, uh, you know, uh, some two, three uh, studies on, um, in, especially in animal hills, there is one uh, study uh, comparing uh, lentil monkeys, nilgiri langur, and giant squirrel resource partitioning uh, by uh, Dr. Sushma. And oh. uh, uh, Dr. Mayawar Singh and colleagues have done a lot of research on co occurrence of, of uh, primates in the animal hills. So there are quite a few. Yes. All right, all right. And uh, so the ne next question for you is that what are your thoughts on the one plan approach and its application to some of our native species, like uh, the lion-tailed macaque? Now, for example, the European zoos are part of the European Endangered Species Program, and hence the conservation breeding program that they have is linked to the in situ approaches. So, do you think such an approach would work well for the for like species like lion? Of course, I mean, I think that is the whole idea of having coordinated the breeding program is for the zoos, Indian zoos to work together rather than individual uh, zoos trying to have their own, uh, you know, captive uh, colony. Uh, I think that's great scope for uh, uh, doing that, uh, you know, in, in species like lantel monkeys and I'm sure there are other species. Yes. Okay, sir. And uh, then there is it. Uh, can assisted reproduction be used for increasing their population growth? I, I, I'm increasing their population. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what is meant so by assisted reproduction, but uh, certainly uh, we can look at uh, you know hormone you know, addressing hormonal problems in in females. For example, um, you know we need to see whether females have uh, normal. Uh, Sexual cycles, if they don't, then why not? And then we can address have hormone uh, implants, for example, to to regularize their uh, sexual cycles. There are a lot of opportunities for doing that. Depends on the on the problem that a particular zoo has. All right, okay. And then the so the question is that in your opinion, which primate has done well in X two conditions in India? What do you think? Uh, what do you I, think has done well and any lesson that can be learned for the uh, lion tail macaque? X2. Yes. X2. You know, actually, yes. lion tail X2. macaque in, uh, in X2 has done reasonably well. In, uh, so in, Indian well in, in the Indian context. In the Indian yes, context. it's only found in India. It is only found in the Western Ghats. Now, they have done reasonably well, uh, you know, in, uh, in all PAs. Uh, and uh, there's a large population outside PAs. So, though, the, you know, there are some problems with those populations because uh, there is land use change, for example, happening in private land. Cardamom uh, being, uh, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is a shade tolerant crop, but uh, the cardamom board is uh, pushing for uh, sun loving cardamom. Uh, with the result that people are removing trees because the cardamom is sun loving. And uh, you know there are coffee being replaced with by tea, for example, in uh, animal lakes. So, so there are problems with private. Uh, I think it's a large population, maybe 20, 30 percent of the population occurs in private land. So that is a problem as which I think the, the you know the forest department and uh, researchers should uh, really address. All right. Um, the population think... in uh, in PS are doing reasonably well. Okay. So I think that answers. There's another question on the same thing that what is the negative impact on the lion tail macaque due to the cardamom plantation? I think that you've answered in this itself. Uh, the the la uh, last question for you, sir, is that in wild are the males not part of a group? Like, are they do they remain solitary? There are probably are solitary males, but uh, the one male that is in the group is not very closely. It is with the group, but it's usually in the periphery because. Uh, you know, they uh, don't engage much in uh, social activities that the females uh, engage in, like grooming, for example. And they usually in the period, they have access to certain food resources for because of their big canines and body size that the females can't access, for example, uh, you know, jackfruit, honey, etc. Mm -hmm. So they are looking for these big, big things, uh, right. uh, you know, uh, for okay. their protein, etc. Fine. So there's one more question that what can you suggest as protein replacers for captive population of long of lion tail maca? I mean, I think that is I think it's a serious problem. I don't know how much zoos are addressing it. Uh, 
because many of the foods that I have seen in a long time ago are mostly carbohydrate food, things like carrots and, you know, things like that, banana mm -hmm. and carrot and modern bread and things like that are hardly any protein in many of these. So, uh, so yeah, I think some zoos give eggs, but there are uh, artificial, uh, you know, cow uh, feed that are available. Uh, maybe that's a replacement. Okay. All right. So, so I think that, that those are the questions for you. Mr. Jana, now we'll take questions for you. Uh, the first question is that uh, it's more of a, it's more of your opinion on it. It says that you have an impressive legacy of 165 years to fall back on. What are the future plans for the for the zoo, and how do you foresee the zoo flourishing for the next one sixty five years? Well, next one sixty five years. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you have a big, big thing in that. Yes. So, uh, so my the the very title of my presentation in pursuit of uh, excellence and sustainability that perhaps sums it up. So this is again, uh, this is perhaps a never ending uh, goal because the moment we you know we reach our goal, then uh, we need to uh, shift the goal post. So uh, that would be a that would be a never, never ending kind of journey. We would uh, we would try to move towards uh, the vision that we have set ourselves, the vision that we have set ourselves. So, uh, but in very uh, year terms. Uh, as I said, this is this is India's oldest zoo, um, and uh, in terms of housing, in terms of number of species housed, uh, we are doing reasonable well, reasonably well. We are, we have done quite well, uh, but then uh, there there need not be any complacency. I mean, the sky is the limit. You can uh, you can do more and more, better and better. So uh, to that extent, uh, we can definitely. We have a long way to go, actually. Right, sir. Okay. Uh, the next question for you, sir, is that uh, Chennai has several other urban wildlife areas as well, including Chennai mm -hmm. Snake Park, the Madras Crocodile Bank. So, what do you consider as the USP for your zoo, and that attracts the visitors to visit repeatedly? So, uh, see, the others, uh, you know, the Chennai Snake Park and all, they are uh, all specialized zoos They, in, in the sense that they do deal with only a couple of uh, species. Whereas Vandalu Zoo's USP lies in the fact that this is a one-stop uh, place for giving you wholesome recreation as well as uh, information, as well as education. So, we have... Uh, we have uh, housed now 182 species, and you you get to see these animals in their various moods and poses and all, and it's it's really refreshing and it's re really rejuvenating. If you uh, and and not only that, there are uh, as I said, there are children's park and the zoo school. So um, it is it is a multifarious kind of uh, entertainment, and uh, yeah, that we try to keep. So that, that perhaps is our USP. Right, sir. All right. Uh, the next question for you, sir, is as per your experience, what do you feel? Is the survival success of hand red animals higher in your zoo as compared to parent red? Compared to, sorry, I didn't get it. Compared to the parent red, the parent taking care of the of the offspring, is it higher in terms of the hand red? So that's, a very, that's a very loaded and a difficult question because uh, a parent is, after all, a parent. You know, uh, uh, no, no other parent or no amount of hand wearing can really substitute uh, for a parental uh, upbringing. So, uh, but then, uh, in those cases, in in those scenarios where the parent has died or uh, it has abandoned the kid, there, of course, the next best thing uh, to happen is the hand wearing and bundles. I, if I can put it that way. Okay. All right. The uh, last question for you is, uh, how is the zoo coping with the second wave of the pandemic? Are there any lessons learned from last year that are in practice right now as a preventive measure? Yeah, as I flagged in my presentation, uh, we have a very uh, strict surveillance protocol and uh, disinfection and surveillance protocol uh, with which we are ensuring that the uh, our keepers are uh, safe and also the animals are safe and the 
uh, this zoonotic disease is uh, not transmitted to the animals or the other way around, that we are ensuring uh, through a strict, you know, um, uh, system of disinfection regime. And uh, we had actually, uh, during the last, uh, after the last lockdown, we had uh, reopened the zoo to the public, uh, we had arrived at the carrying capacity of the people so as not to uh, get crowding and all at 7,000. 7,000 at a given point of time. So, uh, by insisting on that, because the zoo is a vast place, as I said, it is spread over 602 hectares. So, uh, we had controlled the, we had pegged the carrying capacity of the visitors at 7,000 at a given point of time. And we ensured that that, that carrying that, uh, limit was never exceeded. So, uh, now, of course, the zoo has been uh, closed down again, uh, perhaps rightly so, uh, considering the uh, severeness of the second wave. So, uh, once things return to normalcy, then again, uh, we'll, uh, we'll open up and then it would be prudent and it would be well advised to continue to follow this uh, uh, social distancing and other measures. Right. right. All right, sir. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude today's session, today's talk on Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo. Arundhati, I'd like to thank uh, the speakers. Yes. Arundhati, yes. If you allow me, I have uh, just one observation to make, and uh, this, is this is addressed to or uh, directed to uh, Dr. Ajit. Uh, Dr. Ajit, yes, thank sure, you so yeah. much for a, for a very insightful and uh, interesting um, presentation. Now, uh, you have a lot of uh, domain expertise, domain knowledge, so far as uh, in-situ conservation is concerned. Now, it would be very interesting and very useful to relate this knowledge and to get clues and uh, lessons from your uh, knowledge and apply it to a ex-situ kind of environment that the zoo actually operates in. Now, uh, as somebody pointed out, uh, but you have contradicted it, uh, saying that the conservation breeding program of LTM uh, in, in, in cat captivity, the captive, captive breeding has not been uh, as successful as it should have been. Uh, I don't know uh, whom to blame it for it. Is it a commentary on the captive animals performance or uh, it's, a, it's, a perform it's a commentary on the performance of the zookeepers or both? I have no idea. But then uh, it would perhaps, it is high time perhaps, Dr. Ajit, uh, the other day, uh, Dr. Umapati and Dr. Kumara also, they made very interesting presentation, but it's high time that we pulled our heads together and then uh, tried to see how we can, uh, you know, imp improve the delivery of this uh, captive uh, breeding program for LGM. Thank you so much. No, I agree completely. With you, I mean, I think so. It's be great to work together, and uh, uh, since it did not work one, so not because of anybody's problem, it got stuck in Delhi somewhere, and uh, the whole proposal. And I think the money was also gone, but then it got stuck somewhere in Delhi for various reasons. But uh, that doesn't mean that we should not try again. Yes, uh, yes. So uh, there are important okay. lessons learned at that time, and we should work. I'm okay. really, really looking forward to it. Right, sir. Okay, right. on that note, thank you very much. We can, uh, yeah, we will conclude the session. I'd like to thank the speakers for you know uh, for taking time out from the schedules and you know joining in for the talk. I'd like to thank the viewers for you know joining in and being part of the session. And lastly, I would like to just inform that we would be now we would be celebrating week eight next week from uh, May third at uh, Tiruvanthapuram Zoo with Nilgiri Langur as the species in focus. And uh, currently, Aragna Rana Zoological Park is still uh, undertaking activities, which will go on till the end of May. And I would urge you to do visit their site and you know to continue to engage with them on this occasion. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank and you. do take care. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you, sirs. Thank you. Thank you.